strange lights in the sky. Look, it's lit. I have no idea what that was. Objects moving at incredible speeds, breaking the laws of physics. That shot down to the ground at light speed. Craft from another world. They're real. They're here. The truth is out there, and we need to know. Can anyone discover the truth behind UFOs? January, 8 p.m., Winstead, Connecticut. What the hell is that thing? Shoppers in a downtown mall spot something in the evening sky. It's moving. You got it, Pat? The event, like so many nowadays, is recorded on mobile phones. Unbelievable. It's posted onto an internet video sharing site. It's the latest example of an unidentified flying object, a phenomenon that seems to defy explanation. I don't know what it is. Or does it? UFO sightings like this one are reported in their thousands every year, and not just in America. They happen all over the world. No airport around here at all. It's unexplained. From Rio, London, Paris and New York, UFOs are a global phenomenon, a global mystery. For the past 60 years... Whoa, I'm getting a series of lights right there. I got it, I got wherever it. Wherever and whenever unidentified flying objects have been spotted in the sky, they've hit the headlines. Right now, the biggest thing on YouTube is the Israeli UFO which was UFO on top of a sacred temple. Is that a UFO? Amazing. Holy And you can see it sitting on top of it, and then it just shut off at light speeds. <laughs> I looked at a video many times. I think it's real. UFO sightings like these fire the imagination of enthusiasts all over the world. We had, we've seen them in Mississippi like this, but never And like fuel that. investigations to discover what these mysterious objects really are. Oh. In Rachel, Nevada, a small group of men and women who hunt down the clues to help identify strange objects in the sky are gathering. Leader of the pack is Alex Podovich. We actually hunt UFOs. We have regular meetings that we go out in the field and we set up our equipment and cameras, whatever we have, and we watch the skies. And sometimes you do see very strange things in the sky. Unusual objects in the sky like this are what these guys spend hours analyzing. A UFO is something that you cannot identify. It could be our own or it could be alien. It's just an object in the sky that you can't tell for sure what it is. You know, a lot of people associate it with the alien craft, but it's not true. It could be anything in the sky. That's what the term means. It, it's just a phenomena that does not go away. It's kind of like a snowball, and it just gets bigger and bigger. And it's very enjoyable. Pat Travis knows all about UFOs. She's the owner of the Little Ailey Inn in the Nevada desert, the unofficial capital of ufology. It's a mecca for UFO hunters for a good reason. There has been a lot of sightings of craft, of phenomena that no one can explain. There's been craft that have done maneuvers so fast that it's unbelievable. I believe that we cannot be the only beings in this entire magnificent universe. It has to be more. I will always believe that. She thinks UFOs are alien, a view held by some who investigate sightings. First of all, they're real. They're here. And the truth is that they 
created us. We need to know as a human race where we came from, what our origins are. Discovering the truth has been the focus of ufologists for decades, but it's not easy. UFOs are not something called up on demand. The holy grail for UFO hunters is finding a real flying saucer, or a ship, I should say, taking pictures of it, touching it, or getting a physical alien that you can shake hands with and take pictures. Today, Alex and his crew are taking a trip down Nevada's extraterrestrial highway to try to find a UFO. It is always an excitement to go out on a hunt. It's another possibility that I may find something that I've been looking for for so many years. We are driving towards uh, the mailbox, the infamous mailbox. They used to be black, and now it's white. The mailbox is a destination that's passed into UFO folklore. It's a location that's had more than its fair share of UFO sightings. This is the famous mailbox, the white mailbox. And these are the UFO hunters. They'll be with us here tonight. Hopefully we'll find something up in the sky. This UFO hunt is a challenge that's brought the group in plain sight of the security forces that monitor movement around one of the most secretive places on Earth. A US Air Force operating location near Groom Lake, Nevada, better known as Area 51. I can see a tower up on the hill, up on the mountain, and it's probably a radar out there also. Uh, behind that ridge is the installation, and about nine miles south of it is S4. That's where supposedly all the alien craft is being flown. It's right there. We're probably being watched right now from that tower. Uh, they know we're here, and uh, they may show up later at night to see what we're taping. They usually do that if they see people with cameras, they'll come out and investigate what's going on. According to ufologists, this is the place where the government keeps its flying saucers. Physical proof that alien craft are real and they're here on Earth. The incredible claim made headlines in the late 1980s thanks to this man. I'm Bob Lazar. In 1988, physicist Bob Lazar told friends he'd seen flying saucers when he was working on a top secret project at Area 51. There is physical evidence which proves that there is life elsewhere. Bob's job was to re see if he could reverse engineer this propulsion system. Now remember, this is the John Lear's been a friend of Lazar's for over 20 years. He was one of the first he told about seeing America's flying saucers. I met Bob Lazar in 1988, and uh, the first thing he said to me is, I saw a disc today. And I'm sitting here writing, and I said, what? He said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. But that vehicle is a disc, which is generally referred to as a flying saucer. And he told me that, uh, when he first saw it, there was an American flag on it, and, and he thought, well, this explains everything. We've got saucers, it's ours, we developed it. That's where all those rumors are coming from. But then he got to see inside of it, and there was little teeny seats, which were just about this big. And that's when it became all too clear to him that this was an alien craft. The admission by an Area 51 insider caused a media storm. Flying saucers were real and being hidden by the government. What they do is pump protons into the 115. It's my opinion that nothing we have developed has been without ET influence or technology. 
If UFOs and flying saucers are real and being kept in secret bases in the Nevada desert, it begs a series of questions. What are they for? And where and when did America get its hands on them? The Las Vegas UFO hunters are out looking for UFOs. They've gone high tech. They're using a sensitive array of infrared and low light cameras in the hope that it will help them capture images of unknown objects in the sky. This equipment is generally used for um, surveillance in very, very dark environments. Some of them use existing light. They can operate even from starlight. Um, the other one is a traditional green night vision camera, which amplifies light. So if anything comes from that direction towards us and it emits light, we'll see it. Even before the cameras are up and running, Alex spots something in the sky. You can see the contrail, and that looks like probably an F-16. What do you think we're going to see out here tonight? Well, I'm hoping to see something that, that was engineered back, reverse engineered from alien technology. It's Almost gonna, ready. Almost Good. there. If you had the infrared, we may be able to see some things that we can't see with our eyes. Maybe we're they're not still supposed to be seeing. We're not supposed to be seeing. So that gives us a chance to look behind the veil. Is, it, is this legal? Yeah, perfectly legal. OK. You're on public land. OK. If you get arrested, you don't know me. If a UFO is spotted, the hunters have the equipment to capture images of the craft in intricate detail. If they do, it will be a huge moment. We need to make it work. These are our eyes tonight. Well, that was close. Uh, hopefully we'll see some strange lights up there that move in uh, kind of a zigzag way or moving really fast. Look, look over here, this way. Uh, I hope to see a spaceship, actually, <laughs> if it's possible. In the darkness, the hunters spot something off in the distance. Is that thing right over there? There is. It's too dark for conventional cameras to pick out. But what about the low-light ones? They were just moving. It disappeared. Just just dropped like a stone right over there. Oh! oh. It was a big light. Oh, that was beautiful. Look, it's lit. Right there, right he there. Lit. You see him, he's orangey red. One o'clock. Has the infrared and low light camera rig captured it? Okay. Now this just happened. Right above the two, you'll see on our third camera, a light comes up. And then right here is another one. And they both stay up for just about the same amount of time and then disappear. Not moving, they were stationary, and they were there, and then they were gone. And that was not a pixel on the screen, that was not a malfunction. They've spotted something, but they don't know what it is. They hope it could be a flying saucer they believe America keeps hidden away in the desert. It's a notion that's deeply established within UFO circles. A theory that began with the greatest and most controversial flying saucer incident of them all. July the 8th, 1947. The place, Roswell. Debris is discovered on a cattle ranch in New Mexico. But it isn't just any old stuff. Eyewitnesses say the wreckage consists of foil that returns to its shape after being crumpled up and weird, alien-looking writing on beam members. A UFO legend is born. But in a U-turn 24 hours later, Roswell's flying saucer is claimed to be a weather balloon. And a controversy has raged ever since. The interesting thing about the Roswell story is that 
regardless of whose side of the story you believe, the Air Force, the UFO research community, everybody agrees that some sort of object or device came down and was recovered. Now, the big question is, what's being covered up? But do you still get a lot of interest? I mean, do people still come out here and want to know what happened? There's still a little interest. People still come. Nick Redfern is just one of many who have investigated the most famous UFO case of them all. So, Eddie, we're pretty much at the crash site right now. Can you kind of explain? I think one of the main reasons why people are so interested in and fascinated by UFOs is primarily because there's always a yearning for people to look for mysteries. You know, people love mysteries, whether it's UFOs, a Loch Ness monster, Bigfoot ghosts. People love a real-life mystery. And I think when, as I do believe with UFOs, there is a genuine mystery, that makes it even more intriguing. No physical proof that a flying saucer came down in New Mexico has ever been produced. But the rumors that one did began a modern mythology. really where all the evidence was brought. What happened was that when Flying Saucer sightings began in 47, it was something totally new, never been seen before, so people were fascinated by it. The Roswell UFO incident set the scene for an incredible explosion in sightings across America. Over the next 50 years, UFOs grew into a global phenomenon. And now, the reason why is about to emerge. The late 1940s marks the start of America's fascination with UFOs, an obsession that coincided with its Cold War with the Soviet Union. It was a period when America started seeing a lot more unidentified flying objects. The biggest trauma for post-war America uh, in the 50s was the appearance of Sputnik in the sky. Once you get a space race starting, you begin to get this huge rash of UFO technologies being sighted. The atomic age and the space race fed an increasingly popular sci-fi genre. And soon America was awash with B-movies featuring UFOs and invaders from outer space. With films like Earth versus the Flying Saucers or The Day the Earth Stood Still, you begin to get an absolutely clear interrelationship between the kind of sightings that you get in the real world and the B-movie Flying Saucers of the 1950s. In the 50s, this popular culture became reality. UFO sightings were on the rise. And the US military refused to acknowledge that they were responsible. The recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. But that's not true. Back in the 1950s, the Air Force, there's no doubt, was working on projects to try and build circular-shaped aircraft. One of these was known as the Avro car. You know, it looked pretty cool, like this silver, shiny, flying saucer. At the height of the Cold War, both the Soviets and Americans were building experimental machines they hoped could win global supremacy. America's Avro car was one such experiment. It's a very sexy-looking machine with a bubble dome never went higher than a couple of feet off the ground despite having about 3,000 horsepower. The Avro car inspired Paul Moller, an engineer, to build his own version of a flying saucer. I do think it invokes the image of that little Jetson type of machine that we saw in the 60s that, that you know, had the bubble dome and that freedom to move around in the future the way they did. That was very big in America, and I think it drives the interest of people to do it. Well, putting this canopy down really puts you into a very comfortable world. 
Dr. Paul Mahler flying the M200X. Paul Mahler is one of only a handful of people who can claim to have flown a real flying saucer. The OMC rotary engines developing. It's truly a magic carpet sensation. When you're in a helicopter, there's a lot of vibration, number one. And number two, you have the sense you're being lifted from above. This machine here is absolutely no vibration. The rotary engine is like a sewing machine engine. The power comes from below you, and it's a totally different sensation, not supported by anything that you sense. It's really amazing. It's absolutely magic carpet in the sensation. But in a time before widespread use of computer-assisted stabilization, these cumbersome craft carried considerable risk. Start up. The problem on Earth is the aerodynamics. The air flowing around the vehicle generates a lift configuration, which is destabilizing. Now, you can put a big tail on it, of course, and that'll make it aerodynamically stable, but what is that? It's kind of a funny machine, round machine with a big fat tail on it. Doesn't make sense. So, artificial stabilization. When you're not dealing with the atmosphere, when you're outside of the atmosphere, of course, round is the perfect shape. Structurally, it does everything you want. It has all the right things. We just got to get rid of the atmosphere. From an engineering point of view, America's attempts to build a fully operational flying saucer in the 1950s and 60s failed. The project's success was in its propaganda value. America's UFOs were a weapon of sorts. I think one of the bigger issues relative to UFOs is the realization on the part of the military that, hey, you know, this is a phenomenon we can actually use to our advantage. If you imagine at the height of the Cold War, you subtly release information to the Kremlin that, hey, we've got a crash flying saucer, and we've actually begun to understand how and why it flies. That could actually spook the enemy. America's UFOs were propaganda tools, never a serious military threat. Their primary purpose was to mislead foreign intelligence. It acts as a good cover. The deep military projects to build highly advanced aircraft and platforms gets buried amongst a huge mass of stories of back engineering and super secret X-Files type conspiracies. And while we're all running around following them, the real military secrets gets hidden. We now know that rumors which claimed the US was developing its own UFOs were intended to hide something else. But what? Maybe the Las Vegas UFO hunters can help find the answer. They've recorded an unidentified flying object on their equipment. Now they need to discover what it is. Yeah, it's freaking out. Peter Merlin knows a lot about what goes on in the sky over the desert. He says that evidence of UFOs in the sky can often be found on the ground. One of the things people see around Area 51 are strange configurations of lights in the sky, glowing golden orbs, things like that. A lot of the time they're seeing these things. This is an Air Force anti-infrared flare. It provides a, a heat source to decoy heat-seeking missiles. And they look very strange to people on the ground because they seem to hang in the air or move in strange ways with the air currents while glowing and sputtering. The deserts are littered with thousands of these things. These account for a lot of the unusual light sightings in the night sky over Nevada. But Las Vegas' finest don't buy that explanation of what they've seen. They think it doesn't fit. It moved. That light moved. Right there. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, it's on and just faded out. You know, there's a lot of military aircraft up there right now. They're doing the exercises and they're dropping flares. But see, don't see, flares see fall down? That one did look like it fell, but yeah. it was flares float down. That's the nature of flares, is so it oh, illuminates sometimes. an area. They float like this. That shot down to the ground at like light speed. I have no idea what that was. 
probably begin. Look at that light, how it moves. It's coming by, I'm gonna rewind it right here. It's right here. I am freaking out. Nothing moves like that. That's strange. So it's sort of half imagination. What the hell was that? Was that a bomb? Probably. You sure? Yes, I think they're targeting your car, your vehicle. That's not funny, dude. <laughs> the experienced UFO hunters are stumped. They've spotted an unidentified flying object over Area 51. But people like John Lear aren't surprised by sightings like these. They maintain there's a simple explanation. There is nothing that we have developed that hasn't been influenced by ET. They've given us everything. From Roswell, we developed uh, such things as transistors, fiber optics, and things like that. Have the UFO hunters seen one of the reversed-engineered UFOs Bob Lazar talked about in the late 1980s? In the Spring Mountains, 65 kilometers west of Vegas, Peter Merlin's on a mission to find out. We're looking for the remains of a top-secret project capable of flying at speeds of over 2,000 miles per hour and up to 90,000 feet altitude. It was a CIA project tested at Area 51. The question is, was this project based around UFO technology? They looked like craft from other worlds, so one could be forgiven for thinking, wow, that's a UFO. Because if you've never seen something like that, then it most definitely is an unidentified flying object. Now there's a chance to discover the truth. In 1967, one of these ultra-secret prototypes crashed here in the Spring Mountains. Conventional wisdom would be that these sites would be completely cleaned up. I've talked to people who worked on the cleanup crews, and almost universally, they told me, don't even bother looking because the government cleaned up every trace. But when I go to these sites, I find that there's always something left. That is a pretty decent sized piece of titanium. Yeah, there's a little bit of black paint on the outer surface. The airplane was painted black. This is part of a radar absorbent structure, so this would have been one of the most secret components of the airplane. So it, it seems like it would be surprising to find pieces of it out here after they cleaned it up, but yet uh, the desert is littered with it. Peter Merlin has found pieces of the most sensitive military secret of the 20th century. It's not alien, but to the Soviets at the height of the Cold War, it might well have been. It's a technology so advanced that they never saw it coming, literally. America's stealth aircraft, introduced in the 1980s, changed the rules of aerial warfare. Exotic in looks and performance, these ultra-modern aircraft caused a flood of UFO reports over the Nevada desert. But stealth aircraft can't possibly be responsible for all UFO sightings worldwide. What strange craft triggered the others? Now, with modern technology, it may be possible to figure out what they are and where they come from. In today's world of high-tech gadgetry, machines that perform the simplest of functions can often be mistaken for UFOs. This is an aerobot. It's been designed by Paul Moller, the man who built and flew the M200X flying saucer. Well, 
here, what I'm flying here is, an, is a vehicle that was designed for bridge inspection. It's a serious problem. How do you get up and inspect bridges for not risking somebody's life in the process of identifying cracks in the bridges? The US Air Force has used these experimental machines for aerial surveying tasks. It's an unfamiliar technology. These are exactly the types of objects that draw public attention and could be mistaken for UFOs. It's amazing, a lot of times we do not announce a flight of any of the things we're doing, but five o'clock in the morning, we start it up and there's a crowd already here. It's almost like there's some magical communication out there. Everybody wants to see it fly. It's going to be surprising, but you know everything's surprising to start with, right? It's a matter of time. It wouldn't take very long before it'd be common like everything else in our lives. To the untrained or uneducated eye, Paul Muller's gizmos could appear to be unidentified flying objects. But figuring out what it is that people really see in the sky when they report a UFO is the job of this man. Mark D'Antonio is a chief analyst with Mutual UFO Network, an organization which investigates unexplained sightings. When someone sees something, there's a variety of ways in which they can record it. This cell phone video showed up on the web, and just since the late last night, it's already had 187 views. This is basically available for the world to see. It's the UFO recorded over Winstead, Connecticut. Mark's job is to analyze the footage and try to identify what it is. In the majority of cases, what he discovers surprises people. As anyone can imagine with UFO imagery and video, we're going to get uh, a lot of images of things that are actually flying. Um, you have aircraft, insects, birds, occasional rock, or other things flying through the air. And we see a lot of those photos. You know, we'll see frisbees photographed at odd angles. I mean, things like that. For example, take a look at this one. On his database, he's got hundreds of examples of typical UFO shots. Somebody took a picture of an aircraft. But it's a known object. Obviously, it's an aircraft, and that's not a problem. But you see this shape in here. You see this streak right here, and then you see two appendages, one set here, one set there. OK, this is classic because this is a very out of focus object very close to the camera. This is an insect. It's a common example of how a UFO can be captured on film, but never actually seen. Sometimes these objects aren't even flying at all. Many times people photograph things genuinely because they need them for work or whatever. But then later, when they review the pictures, they see something odd because they didn't see it when the photo was taken. In this particular case, over here in the corner, these two objects showed up. And they were submitted as two objects that were not seen uh, when the photo was taken. I looked at that and I, I started laughing. I said, you know, this makes my day. Because what that is, is just a staple. <laughs> 95% of all the UFO material sent in to Mark for analysis turns out to be known objects, simply misidentified or captured in an unusual way. The UFOs typically become IFOs, identified flying objects, and they turn out to be planes and helicopters and atmospheric phenomena and celestial bodies like meteors and all kinds of things. But what about the sightings that can't be categorized so easily? All the other imagery that we've looked at so far have been in that 95% known category that we've talked about before, you know, aircraft, insects, flares. In this particular case, this is a true UFO. This is an unidentified flying object. It's a true unknown. It's one of those that has been subjected to all the analysis already by far more than just me. True unknown. Most of what we're talking about is some very small percent of unidentifieds. It's this small residue that everybody is really fighting over. 
And of course, if the believers are right, if even one of those is really, really, really real, then extraterrestrial craft are real. It's a view that's dogged the UFO community from the beginning. Something flying in the sky that is unidentified and is an object isn't by definition an alien spaceship. There's no reason why in 2011, if somebody sees a circular craft in the sky, that has to be built by aliens. And here's proof. Winstead, Connecticut. Spectators in a dimly lit car park spot a strange object in the sky over a stop and shop mall. It creates a stir. <laughs> the sighting is recorded on camera phones and is posted up on the internet within hours. It's been spotted where there are no reports of any air traffic. There are no blimps or advertising craft in the vicinity. To all present, it's an unidentified flying object. Unbelievable. The problem is that as the technology advances, it becomes easier and easier to hoax things that look really good. Whereas, say, 30, 40 years ago, a good UFO photograph may actually have been a real UFO photograph because it was hard to fake. Today, you know, a really good UFO could be some spotty 16-year-old teenager in his mom's spare bedroom putting together a piece of footage, putting it on the internet and laughing at all these wide-eyed UFO researchers. Okay, coming in. This UFO is a hoax. Good. Connecticut's latest flying saucer sighting started life in a basement right. workshop nice. a little over 24 hours before. Okay, lights. Good, there we go. <clears throat> One there. That's it's an experiment thought up for this investigation by MUFON analyst Mark D'Antonio. There's so much available off-the-shelf technology that allows you to put together a craft in no time at all that people can mistake, misidentify. It makes our job very difficult uh, in trying to discern what's real, what's not, because the unknowns are out there, and that's what we're after. But this isn't a case of the gamekeeper turning poacher. Mark D'Antonio is on a mission. What's this guy? I think it's really critical that people understand what types of things they are seeing in the sky, whether it's a meteor or it's a four-bladed quadcopter with lights. There's thousands of these out there now, thousands. We, we have to show people what these are because too many people are reporting these and then think they've had a life-changing event. When in fact, they were looking at someone fooling them. We want to raise that public awareness. That's very important. And we want to expose the hoaxers for who they are and show with this how that works. It's pretty neat. All right, here we go. OK. The Winstead UFO sighting has been explained. It's one of the 95% that are. But what about the 5% that remain unidentified? Doug Wilson is at the sharp end of UFO sightings. He's a field operative for MUFON. With 30 years of experience as an investigator, I can usually tell within a few minutes of an interview what the chances are that I'm looking at a planet, an aircraft, or what have you, regardless of how adamant the witness might, might say, this was not an airplane. Do we have a case where you can honestly say, I've exhausted everything, and yet I don't know what it was? It happens. In such cases, Doug knows why a lot of people instinctively make the link to outer space. I think people do feel the need to have an explanation for everything. We've got 
Star Wars, Star Trek, any number of science fiction that people look at and they think automatically outside of the Earth. And so if you don't give them an answer, they will come up with one on their own, and frequently it is extraterrestrial. Blockbuster movies and hit TV shows may have kept our appetite for UFOs alive, but it's been the lack of disclosure and sightings that defy explanation that really fuel our search for answers. An incident 60 years ago gave a town in New Mexico a marketing dream. and gave birth to an industry that cashes in on man's fascination for the unknown. But the truth is, the facts behind the Roswell incident have been released. I think the best explanation for the entire Roswell incident was it was a physics experiment that, that got lost and that led to some unintended consequences. Today, the official explanation for Roswell is the crash of a top-secret listening device codenamed Project Mogul. And these balloon trains were huge assemblies. We've got a picture of one right here. It was 600 feet tall. It was about half the height of the Eiffel Tower. Unlike those who maintain a flying saucer crashed, physicist David Thomas has evidence that supports the official version of events. This is a small replica of the uh, I-beam that was uh, found in the Roswell debris. These strange markings are the key to unlocking the UFO mystery. It's not alien writing, as some believe. It's something much more down to earth. And crucially, it links it to Project Mogul. They were made for the Army Signal Corps by a toy company in Manhattan called Merrick Manufacturing. And, and the reflectors were a little flimsy, and when the Army Air Force said, can you make them stronger, they applied some tape they had sitting around the toy factory. And this tape had these strange, colorful, sort of hieroglyphic symbols that could have been interpreted as alien writing. It's exactly the same design described by eyewitnesses. But instead of being alien writing, the truth is, it's toy wrapping tape. Despite the evidence, it isn't enough for some people. 60 years of speculation can't be swept away so easily. No one's going to hide a weather balloon coming down. There's no point. And even a mogul balloon, there are examples of mogul balloons coming down elsewhere in the US in the summer of 47. They weren't subject to stringent security like the Roswell event was. So I think for me that rules out a mogul balloon. The real truth behind the most famous UFO of all time may never be universally accepted. But the facts reveal that in the vast majority of cases, an explanation for most UFOs can be found. Simple misidentification, atmospheric conditions, hot air balloons, hoaxes, even staples can all become unidentified flying objects. But the question remains, what are those that stay unidentified? There are those people who understand that while there are a lot of mystery lights and things happening in the sky, some of them of a perhaps clandestine nature, there's no good evidence that any extraterrestrial craft is visiting the planet Earth. Believers will still hunt for the evidence. Light speed. That, that one, the last one, it's right here. In my opinion, the truth behind UFOs is that First of all, they're real. They're here. Roswell, New Mexico. Something did crash, and I do believe that I was a, a alien spacecraft. But for those of us who just look to the skies and wonder... 80 to 90 percent of all UFO sightings are explainable. But as a rational person trying to keep an open mind, I would have to say that there is no reason to believe that aliens could not be here. It's kind of like people's belief in God. You can't prove it, 
but you'll be damned if you'll deny it in total.